Section 1 of The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November 2020. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. What is the Royal Jelly? By C. J. Robinson. I propose, by permission, to discuss in the columns of the Bee Journal the hitherto puzzling problem, What is Royal Jelly, that substance known to produce the transformation of worker larvae to queens? Profound scientists of Europe and this country have delved into the secrets of the grand problem, but none of them have handed down a satisfactory solution. Yet it does not seem rational that the question is so abstruse as to forever remain past finding out what the so-called royal jelly consists of, the source from which it is derived, its definite action on larvae, and whether it is administered by the workers as a nourishing element to larvae in royal cells, or for the purpose of impregnating the larvae, as pistiliferous flowers are impregnated with pollen, and thus develop a female bee fully qualified to reproduce males. The settled doctrine of writers on bee matters is, that it is chiefly due to the excess of food served to the larva by the workers that produces the transformation from worker to queen. Still, no writer has ventured to assert that such is a demonstrated fact. The late Baron of Berlepsch, the able expounder of the Thierson theory, and the most scientific and practical apicultural writer and experienced apiarist in all Europe, wrote thus. Every hypothesis, however, yet submitted from any quarter, rests chiefly upon the assumption that the development of fertile workers and queens has by some means been overstimulated for a brief period, and as the result affects the sexual organs more especially, the quantity and quality of the food administered has been looked to as the exciting cause. If his assumption be admitted, then individual female bees are very likely to be reproduced imperfectly developed in all the degrees between a rudimentary fertile worker up to a perfect queen. Furthermore, were it true that development depends on quantity of food or the overstimulating caused by high feeding, the workers would be able to supply themselves with queens at all times, when, on the contrary, it is well known that workers cannot always perfect queens when furnished with everything necessary for that purpose, except the impregnating principle, semen. A full knowledge of the reproduction of the honeybee is of great importance, and at the very foundation of the science of bee culture, and of great value to those who intend to breed the superior races of bees, especially the principles of hybridizing so as to prevent their deterioration and improve the breeds. And it is of great moment to the science of entomology to determine whether insects are produced by parthenogenesis, as is believed, or by semen received by the male progenitors. As for myself, I have conclusive evidence that such queens as are reproduced by furnishing a colony of black bees with eggs laid by an Italian queen is in some degree hybridized. All of the points in the Dierson theory have been demonstrated, except his theory of the reproduction of bees, particularly drones and queens. It seems that he was sorely puzzled in his profound research to comprehend the laws involved in the strange phenomena, virgin queens reproducing male bees, and to dispose of the, to him, inexplicable point in his colossal theory, he jumped at a conclusion which was based upon the hypothetical doctrine advanced by Professors von Seibold, Leuckart, and Dr. Donhoff, the fathers of the theory called parthenogenesis, that is, procreating without male sperm. 
it was during the period that dr Ziazon was making public his theory that mr elihu kirby of henrietta new york attempted to make known the result of his long time and attentive research into the principles of reproduction of the different races of honeybees he was a scientific apiarist of long experience and enthusiastic in the cause of progressive bee culture not until eighteen sixty one was there published or circulated in this country a periodical devoted to bee affairs and scarcely no attention was given to scientific bee culture at the time mr k communicated to the american bee journal at different times just after its advent the discoveries he had made relative to the reproduction of bees but not much attention was given it further than a brief notice by the editor the lamented samuel wagner who like the great Ziazon, seemed not to comprehend the evolution of the reproduction of insects during the period of eighteen fifty nine to sixty three mr kirby was in failing health and when in the summer of eighteen sixty three he was about to bid adieu to his long cherished theme and go from the altar of home on earth to a heavenly inheritance he besought me to further his designs and he committed to my charge his new theory of the reproduction of drones and female bees the result of the case thus consigned to me is as follows conclusions that i have come to derive from careful observations for many seasons that is videlicet to produce drones the workers fecundate the worker larvae in royal cells with drones semen which gives the elements of queens the workers supply the said larva with animal secretion water bee bread and honey until it secretes sufficient material for a queen and when the larva arrives at maturity it is then metamorphosed to an egg substance from thence it passes to a chrysalis state and in the pupa state her ovary is formed and impregnated with semen retained in the larva state imparting the elements of life she then leaves her cell and is prepared to lay eggs that produce drones only without further fecundation and when the drones are matured from their natural genital propensities deposit their semen in the queen's spermateca to enable her to fecundate her full-grown eggs to produce workers and also deposit semen where the workers can obtain it in the absence of the drones to perfect queens and for storing it in their combs where it retains its vitality at least from the time that the drones are expelled until they are reproduced the following season it is ascertained that the drones and queens can be hybridized by their drone progenitors in the embryo state which is conclusive evidence of their being fecundated with drones semen to produce workers the drones deposit their sperm in the queen's spermatheca while on the wing and on top clasping the drones back to herself and from thence she fecundates full-grown eggs as they pass the mouth of her spermatheca on the way out of her oviduct and by the combining of the elements of the drone and worker in one by which the worker is produced thus there can be no logical reasoning in saying that the workers are produced by semen and the drones and queens are produced without semen to produce queens the worker fecundates the worker larvae in royal cells with drones semen which gives the elements of the drone worker and queen combined in one in the larval state it secretes in its growth the proper material for perfect queens and when the larva arrives at maturity it is transformed to an egg form and then to a chrysalis and in that state her embryo ovary is formed and impregnates in the upper points or sacs of her ovary and contains the elements of myriads of drone egg germs before leaving her cell and her physiology is changed in her transition from the chrysalis state to a perfect queen and is qualified before leaving her cell to lay eggs that will produce drones only to be fully qualified to produce workers she must receive a deposit of semen from the drone in her spermatheca 
if once filled with semen it is efficacious through life and qualifies her to fecundate the full-grown drone eggs as they pass the mouth of her spermatheca and causes them to produce workers and to lay all the eggs both male and female and workers that the colony may require it is ascertained that the embryo drone workers and queen can each be hybridized in the ovary egg or larva state which is communicated to the whole production i think the evidence conclusive in the reproduction of the queen the fertile workers are produced by the workers taking the drones semen into their stomachs and from thence it is transmitted to their embryo ovary and fecundates it which gives the element of life to the progeny and qualifies them to lay eggs which produce drones only unless the eggs are further fecundated by being brought into contact with semen it appears that the young queen's ovary on leaving her cell and the ovary of the fertile worker when fecundated are identical in the production of drone eggs therefore the evidence is that semen is the agent in both cases i wish to call attention particularly to the following points first the embryo ovary of young queens must be fructified before she leaves her cell with drones semen which gives the elements of life to her drone progeny and forms the basis for the whole progeny of bees to produce the three sexes of bees there are three distinct fecundations first the embryo ovary of the pupa queen to produce the drones second the full-grown egg to produce the workers third the worker larva is fecundated by the workers with semen given off by the drones to produce the queens and all in the larval state they secrete sufficient material to perfect in their transition either drones workers or queens and they each can be hybridized in the embryo state second in the reproduction of bees there are two distinct egg forms first the eggs that produce the larva second the larva when it arrives at maturity is transformed to an egg substance of which it forms the chrysalis that produces the perfect bees and their sexes third it requires three states of existence to perfect the organisms of bees first the larva second the chrysalis third the perfect bee the queen first deposits her eggs in the proper cells or utricles in which the larva is hatched and supplied by the workers with animal secretion and food until their transition to an egg substance or chrysalis i will propose the following question for consideration what is it that is found in the royal jelly that is possessed of such impregnating powers as to cause the ovaries of the workers to produce drone eggs richford new york march 14 1881 end of section 1section number two of the american bee journal volume seventeen number twelve march twenty third eighteen eighty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. dot org recording by sawyer ruiz the american bee journal volume seventeen number two march twenty third eighteen eighty one putting wires into comb foundation by J. G. Witten. Mr. John F. Cohen, in his article on the practical use of foundation, published in the Bee Journal of March 9th, says, It has been practically demonstrated to my satisfaction that these results can only be attained by Mr. Given's method of introducing the wires, and if by a happy combination of the Dunham foundation could be made and wired by the Given, or a similar process, the foundation controversy would be virtually ended. I would like to say to Mr. Cohen and others who may be interested that last season I hived about 40 full-size natural colonies on Dunham Foundation in Quinby frames prepared in the following manner. The frame is wired by sewing two horizontal wires spaced off so there will be three equal spaces from the top bar down. 
I use a triangular top bar and fasten the foundation by pressing it down to the bar with a thumb and then running a stream of melted wax and rosin over it. Then, by running a wheel made of a scent over the wire, I embed the wire into the foundation. This also forms a groove in the foundation in which I run a stream of melted wax which covers the wire and when drawn out will be perfect and will neither sag nor break out by extracting. There should be a good half inch of space between the foundation and the bottom bar as it will settle enough to bulge the comb if left at full length. To give it a thorough trial I hive two heavy natural colonies in one hive with the mercury at 90 in the shade and basswood honey coming in very fast and when drawn out of every comb it was perfect. By bending a spoon so that it will pour a small stream and with a little practice you will find it a short task to fasten the foundation in the frames. Genoa, New York, March 14, 1881. End of section 2. Section 3 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E.J. Lavery, Boston. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Importing Bees from Italy by Charles de Dant Mr. A. Salisbury, under the above heading, says that it is no longer a question. The Italian bee of Italy is not a distinct race. Later investigation proves the fact that there are black bees in Italy as anywhere else, even in the vicinity of Rome itself. Mr. Jones at the convention in Cincinnati last fall asserted that he had seen black bees at several places in Italy, even in the vicinity of Rome. All my inquiries, as well as the reports of prominent and disinterested beekeepers of Italy, such as Mr. Mona and Dr. Dubini, prove that there are no hybrid bees in Italy, and of course no black bees. Will Mr. Jones tell us in which apiaries he saw black bees? Of course, by black bees we understand entire colonies of black bees. Then he saw also colonies of hybrid bees, for the mixing could not be prevented. But if Mr. Jones saw only a few black or seemingly black bees in a colony, this circumstance caused either by the dark contents of their stomachs or by some other accidental cause, we cannot infer from it that there are black or impure bees in Italy. I hope that Mr. Jones will answer this question. Mr. Jones adds that, in his opinion, the Italian bees were descended from the bees of Holy Land, or those on the island of Cyprus. Such an opinion raises the question, are the yellow bees from Cyprus, from Syria, or from Italy the original bees, or the black bees, of more northern climates the original bees, the yellow color being only an improvement? According to the law of natural selection, the yellow bees of these three countries are about similar, because the three countries enjoy a mild climate. The idea of Mr. Jones's that the Italian bees descended from the bees of Cyprus or of Syria cannot be sustained, for it leads to the idea of large importations of bees from these countries into Italy, at a time when the means of transportation were few, long, and difficult. The introduction of a few colonies of these bees into Italy would have been unable to effect the smallest change in the race then existing. For by our introduction of Italian bees, we have experienced how hard it is to overcome the returning to the type which is prevalent in a country. Besides, although we have had too little time to study the habits of the Cyprian bees, having received our queens last summer only, we have noticed, while they resemble in color the Italian, their habits are not the same. For instance, the Cyprian bees do not cling to the combs as persistently as do the Italians, and resemble more the blacks in this respect. The Cyprian queens, like the common queens, are more easily frightened and more difficult to find than the Italian queens. 
As to their other qualities, we are unable to say anything. It will take a few seasons to test them thoroughly. It is therefore desirable to see them tested by a great number of beekeepers in comparison with Italian bees. I read in the Italian bee paper, Le Epicoltore, for January, just received, that the Central Society of Italian Beekeepers will have an exhibition on the 1st of May, to which the beekeepers are invited to send bees from every part of the country, probably to answer the assertion of Mr. Jones that there are black bees in Italy. In order to compare the varieties which can exist on the entire peninsula, the report of the commission of this society will thus put an end to the discussions between those who contend that there are black bees in Italy, and those who say that the Italian bees are all pure. Yet, it is well to remember here that in Italy as well as in Germany, they count but two yellow rings, for they do not count as a ring the first segment to which the thorax is attached. Hamilton, Illinois, February 5th. 1881. End of section 3. Recording by E. J. Lavery, Boston. Section 4 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881, Section 4. Bees and Grapes, Rev. M. Mahan, D.D. I noticed that the question whether bees destroy sound grapes is again being discussed. I have been a beekeeper for 11 years, and during most of that time, have raised grapes enough for family use, and I have given considerable time and attention to the question under discussion. All my observations go to show that bees do not puncture sound grapes. I have seen them sucking the juice from grapes that had been broken by birds and have picked off the broken grape, and watch the result. The bees would run about over the bunch hunting for an opening and finally abandon the search. Last season, a great many grapes were destroyed or injured in this part of the country, and I gave the matter special attention. Many of the grapes cracked more or less from the effects of rains following dry weather, and many more were broken more or less by birds. As forage was scarce, the bees worked industriously on these broken grapes until they were all gone. But on all the bunches, there were some grapes that were not broken, and these remained on the vines until late in the season. After the juice had been sucked from all the broken skins, I saw the bees for many days vainly searching for openings from which they might obtain the supplies they had been accustomed to draw from the broken fruit. These sound grapes remained on the vines, in some cases, for weeks, after the bees had ceased to get anything from the broken ones. Now it is plain that the juice of these very ripe grapes would have been quite as acceptable to them as that from the ones they are accused of having punctured and destroyed and to my mind it is clear that if they had punctured and destroyed as many as they are accused of doing, they would not have become suddenly reformed as the grapes became sweeter and more delicious. I will not affirm that bees cannot puncture the skin of a grape, but I do affirm that as far as my very careful observation enables me to judge, they do not. And if I am correct in this, the injury done to the grapes is very small. The injured grapes would spoil in a few days if the bees were not to touch them. As far as I have been able to observe, wasps, hornets, etc., do little injury to grapes. The mischief results mostly from the cracking of the skin by a very few days even of wet weather after it has been dry for some time. The skin of the grapes becomes so full that a jar from the wind or from the alighting of a bird on the bunch will cause them to crack, and then, if there is a dearth of honey, they are sure to be sucked dry by the bees, with more or less help from yellow jackets, hornets, and wasps. It is possible that in some cases the skins are cut by wasps, etc., but I think the cases are exceptional. Huntington, Indiana, March 4, 1881. 
End of section 4. Recording by Andrea Milliken. Section 5 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881, Section 5. The Use of Separators for Box Honey Greiner Brothers In starting an apiary, it is of great importance to adopt a hive that will prove satisfactory to the manager in all its features, for the present as well as for the future. It is not an easy matter, after an apiary has been started and hives and appliances have accumulated, to change the sizes or dimensions of such, if they should not be satisfactory. In the different manifestations of the hive, we find that it is necessary to have brood frames and sections interchangeable. In fact, it is still more convenient to have all the different parts of the hives as uniform as mechanical workmanship can produce them, so that frames, honey boards, division boards, covers, sections, mats, etc., may be picked up anywhere and adjusted to any hive desired. The use of separators is another feature of this kind. If once adopted and the bees arranged accordingly, it may cause considerable trouble to remodel a lot of appliances, especially if separators of any perceptible thickness are used. In the Bee Journal for February 2, Mr. Hedden gives some very good hints on hive and section making, but we cannot endorse all his points, and in this article we refer in particular to his closing sentence. It seems strange to us that Mr. Hedden pronounces separators nuisances, whilst other prominent beekeepers, and we believe the majority, use them and advocate their use. It must certainly be a query to young beginners who seek information amongst the contributors of the journal to encounter such square contradictions. Our experience is about as follows. The two first years of our experience in beekeeping found us equipped with open surplus cases. We mean by surplus cases the adjustable half story with the proper number of frames containing sections. The seasons were good and the crops abundant, but the shape of a good share of our honey was anything but desirable. It was not uniform in thickness, nor even, some being thick on one end and thin on the other. Some were missed entirely, whilst the adjoining one bulged out to take up the space. In short, the variations were many. To glass and crate this honey for market cost us considerable trouble, and we concluded to try separators. The 25 cases we had prepared and used the next season at our honey apiary proved to be a success. The honey was just splendid. The sections in shape, thickness, and weight were as near perfect as could be desired, and we decided at once to produce honey in no other way. However, we were not entirely satisfied. We knew separators were objected to by some beekeepers on account of a smaller yield. Mr. Hedden says on page 33 of the journal, These separators cost me too great a portion of my surplus crop. To satisfy ourselves on this point, we used the following season about 100 cases, rigged as the first 25 with separators, which we scattered in our different apiaries side by side with open ones. The result was that we noticed very little difference, if any, in the amount of honey stored, and the editor's opinion on page 59 was exactly our experience. Again, Mr. Hedden claims the first cost and trouble of manipulating to be objectionable. We admit separators are an expense, but they need not be very costly. We use basswood, costing us less than a cent each. And even at twice that cost, would it not be economy then to expend a comparative small amount if we can thereby produce honey in much more attractive shape? Besides, we claim separators lessen the trouble of manipulating instead of increasing it. The reason we use wood is because it is cheaper than metal and we believe better adapted on account of its being the most natural material for bee habitations. Since we introduced separators, the percentage of unfinished honey is greatly reduced. 
At the end of the honey season, we formerly found open cases almost filled with comb and honey, and not one single finished section among them. This is not so much the case since we use separators. When the flow of honey begins to diminish, we have noticed our bees to be at work in a portion of the sections, whilst the remainder would not be occupied at all. We have also taken off cases at the end of a honey flow, which were entirely empty except two or three sections, and these were finished and marketable. To be sure, these are extremes, but it shows the benefit of separators. It might appear from the last part of this article that we apply surplus cases regardless of the working capacity of our colonies. Circumstances may sometimes compel us to do so, but we aim to give our bees no more surplus room than they can occupy. Naples, New York, March 6, 1881. End of section 5. Recording by Andrea Milliken. Section 6 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E. J. Lavery, Boston. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881 Texas for Bees and Honey by Dr. J. E. Lay I write to answer several communications in regard to the adaptability of our great state to beekeeping, and as apiculture is engrossing the minds of many of the most energetic, progressive, and scientific men of our land, I recognize the difficulty of even venturing an opinion. As our great state is so varied in climate and flora, I will state that my remarks have reference to my own section of perhaps a radius of 100 miles. I have lived in Texas since 1850. I passed my boyhood days on her beautiful prairies, amid her thousands of flowers of every hue, freighting our incomparable sea breeze with more than Arcadian sweetness. Silence banished from her woodland slopes by the joyous carol of beautiful songbirds. Ever delighting in the marvelous beauties of nature, how could I fail to love so beauteous a sunlit home? Yes, and as a grown-up boy, I love it still. Greek nor Roman, not even William Tell loved his country better than I. Therefore, my beekeeping friends will pardon me if I seem to color a little too strongly. Our state is being filled with energetic farmers who are reaping rich harvests from the virgin soil, for nearly all kinds of seeds that are sown spring forth under the genial rays of the sun to sixty and hundredfold. Reasoning by analogy, I opine that beekeeping will result in like manner. Apiculture is in its nascent form here but the sun of science begins to warm its quickening form. I have studied the best works on apiculture, but have not given it a thorough practical test yet. I purpose doing so this season. There are but few bees in our country, all blacks except my little apiary of seven colonies, which consists of hybrids and blacks. I intend to Italianize in March, for they indeed possess many advantages over the blacks. I have just wintered successfully in simplicity hives, plain, without any sort of protection whatever, and this is the coldest winter I ever saw in Texas. Dispatches state that at this time almost the entire north is covered with snow. While my bees were in a quiver of excitement today, February 4th, bringing in rich loads of pollen and honey from turnips, mustards, and etc., I could but delight in their rush of joy. How different is the climate over which our vast brotherhood reaches! Our honey plants reach nearly through the entire year, yielding as good nectar as ever tickled the palate of man. In fact, the harvest for bees is almost endless, better, of course, some months. The market for honey has never been developed, a few old gums to rob for big meeting, or for some extraordinary visitors about all ever obtained. 
Bees do no good here these days. The moth destroy them, says the old settlers. The moth skulks away in the light of scientific beekeeping, and its depredations are nil. To be successful, all should study the science, read good books on the subject, learn by close practical observation, read the periodicals of our wide-awake bee men, among which there is none better than the American Bee Journal. Energy and perseverance alone will succeed even in the sunlit clime of Texas. Without these, all will just as surely retrograde. Hallettsville, Texas End of Section 6 Recording by E.J. Lavery, Boston Section 7 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. For the American Bee Journal, Alcyc Clover as a Honey Plant, L. James. Much has been written for the journal about the value of this variety of clover for its yield of honey and hay. Such has not been my experience with it, sown on nineteen acres of land and extending over eleven years. In 1869 I bought some thirty-eight pounds of the seed of Mr. Thomas of Canada. The cost to me, of the seed, duty, and express charges, was eighteen dollars. Having nine acres of ground planted with apple trees that had been bearing for some time, and wishing to seed it down to grass, I had the ground well prepared for the reception of the seed, and a good rain fell just after it was brushed in. It came up nicely, and as there was favorable rains all through the summer it grew finely. The following season it grew in length of stem and quantity of bloom far beyond my expectation, and when in its full bloom it was a beautiful sight, resembling an ocean of blossoms, and as I looked upon it you may rely upon it my calculations of boxes of nice alcyc clover honey loomed up in large proportions, but like many another calculation based upon what our bees are going to do, it was all in fancy, and I was doomed to disappointment. Day after day their flight was just in the opposite direction, with only here and there a bee to be seen on it. There was a body of timber three-quarters of a mile distant in the direction they were flying, with pastures well set in white clover between this timber and the apiary, and I suppose the white clover pastures was the source of honey supply. This state of things continued for some time, and seeing a bee-man passed by that lived in the timber, I inquired how his bees were getting along. He replied they were doing finely, as they ought to, for he had never seen heavier honeydews. That was the secret, and soon my boxes began to show evidence of the dark stuff being put into them, instead of alcyc honey. Fortunately for me, before much of it was stored in the boxes, some heavy dashing rains washed it down from the leaves, and there was no more of the dew for them to gather. The alcyc and white clover were in bloom for some time after this, but for some cause the bees paid little attention to it, and I was vexed to see the promise of a rich return for my expenditure frustrated. I took it for granted that the season was not congenial for its production of honey, as I knew the same to be the case with white clover, as it was last summer. After this, at different times, I sowed two other orchards of five acres each with alcyc, neither of which did as well as the first piece sown, want of timely rains, etc., being the cause. But by continuous sowing I succeeded in having them tolerably well set with it. Receiving no perceptible benefit from it, commensurate with its trouble and expense, I have for some time been satisfied that in central Illinois, where our white clover is so abundantly furnished in our pastures and roadsides, without any expense, and hardy at that, it is time and money put to a poor use. 
as a hay producing plant it amounts to but little after the first season as it becomes dwarfed in habit and i believe will eventually be but little larger in growth under like circumstances than the white variety the white clover is the honey plant for our latitude and i presume the alsike for sweden from whence it came and corresponding latitudes after having had eleven years experience with it i think it unworthy of attention from bee men either for honey or hay at least where the hardy white clover comes spontaneously to our hands there is one thing i ought not to omit in sowing this canadian seed i introduced a kind of cockle different from any i have seen in pennsylvania or ohio that holds its own much better than the clover and i begin to think it will be a standing pest difficult to get rid of atlanta illinois end of section 7 recording by lawrence trask section 8 of the american bee journal volume 17 number 12 march 23 1881 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. The Supply and Queen Trade by A. B. Weed. Read before the Northeast Convention. The Supply and Queen Trade. A. B. Weed. This is a subject, I believe, of interest to all who are engaged in apiculture either as beekeepers, supply dealers, or queen breeders, and is growing as the business extends. The supply business seems as yet to be in a crude state, and prices lack uniformity. In many cases we find needless cutting of prices. It may be said that this is a good thing for buyers, but I believe that the opposite is the case, for the inevitable result of unreasonably low prices is inferior goods when prices are so lower that there is no margin left for profit the trade will not be supported with the enterprise which is necessary to stimulate improvements or inventions or even to put the business on a good footing the character of the business can be best maintained if the energy of manufacturers is directed to the perfecting of goods rather than the cheapening of them good tools are necessary in any pursuit and seem to be associated with a thrifty business in fact the prosperity of a business is largely dependent upon the means at hand of carrying it on if one tool is better than another even if the difference is slight it is worth very much more for the benefit of the difference is felt every time that it is used a good thing may be a source of profit and a poor one of loss the best is always the cheapest there is one respect in which the business is in a better condition than many others and that is that there is but very little credit given this is an advantage to both parties for the seller loses nothing through bad debts and the prompt buyer does not have to pay for the losses caused by the careless or dishonest ones it is quite common among supply dealers to guarantee safe arrival of goods this condition of sale is unnecessary as the express receipt is sufficient and in case of injury or loss the fact is more readily proven and damages more easily collected than could be from some dealers it is unreasonable to expect the dealer to be responsible for goods after they have left his hands especially when the consignee can adjust any difficulty more easily at his end of the line this is the customary rule in business when articles are sent by mail the buyer can protect himself against loss by having the article registered but the precaution is almost unnecessary as it is very rarely that anything is lost in the mails of course the sender is required to use necessary care in packing with most shippers this is a point of pride the traffic in queen seems to be closely allied to the supply business at least so i have found it for as the beekeeper begins to feel the need of good tools he sees the advantage of good stock as well and he naturally looks in the same direction for both 
I believe that I express the opinion of the best queen breeders when I say that it is much more satisfactory to sell a good queen at a correspondingly good price, even if the profit is no greater in proportion, than a cheap and poor one, for the reason that a queen, wherever she goes, will represent the stock from which she came. And I believe, too, that I speak the opinion of all observing apiarists when I say that it pays infinitely better to keep good queens than poor ones. Thus it is that good queens at good prices are more profitable to both parties. Some of the best apiarists have discontinued selling any queens that are not possessed of a high degree of merit, and send out only those which are thoroughly tested and found to be good. In return, they receive a suitable price from appreciative customers. This is notably the case in localities where honey raising is an established business, and the value of good stock is therefore understood. It is now almost universally held by apiarists that if good queens are to be obtained, they must be raised under favorable conditions. It is freely admitted that to bring about these conditions requires a large outlay of time and thought as well as money. This especially is the case when queens are to be reared out of season. The cost of rearing queens will decide their price, for of course they will not be sold at prices which do not pay for rearing, and a reasonable profit besides. If buyers insist on having cheap queens, they will get them, but their value will be found to correspond with their price the one price rule which is applied to queens throughout the country has the effect of causing many poor ones to be sold at fair prices which really should be killed it has the tendency to discourage the rearing of very superior ones for as a rule a thing is no better than its price when they are all sold at a uniform price it is to be expected they will be nearly alike in merit as there is no special inducement for the breeder to improve his stock. The uniformity of price probably originated in the supposition that all queens are equally good, whereas experience proves the opposite to be true. A queen that lays even a few more eggs daily than another is much more valuable, for the extra number of eggs will be multiplied by the number of days that she is kept. This difference alone, so often repeated, will in time amount to more than the price of the queen. A poor queen is kept at a corresponding loss, although both may have sold at the same price. There are such things as plus and minus outside of algebra. The buying of queens at present has some resemblance to a lottery. They should be graded, at least so far as this is possible, and priced accordingly. Combinations for the maintenance of artificial prices are impracticable and undesirable. I would only submit that prices be based upon cost of production and a reasonable profit. Detroit, Michigan. End of section 8. Recording by Lawrence Trask. Section 9 of the American Bee Journal. Volume 17. Number 12, March 23rd, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23rd, 1881. For the American Bee Journal, Who is to Blame for the Losses? C. H. Dibburn. Already the reports of fearful losses are coming in thick and fast. Every severe winter the story is the same. Now the question arises, are these losses of bees inevitable every cold winter? If so, then our business as beekeepers is still a mere matter of luck. During the last few years of mild winters, the outdoor wintering men have had things about their own way in our bee papers. Now, are these papers not a little to blame for admitting articles to their columns giving bad advice to the inexperienced? Many have advocated the wintering on summer stands without protection or care, and persistently claim to be masters in beekeeping. I am perfectly willing to admit that bees can be wintered very nicely on summer stands in a mild winter, also that they are wintered successfully if well packed in chaff in a cold winter. 
but i claim that the labor of preparing them is more than double that of cellar wintering i contend that the only certain way is to prepare a suitable place especially for the bees if a cellar have the floor cemented and see that it is dry dark and well ventilated in such a place they will not consume more than half the amount of honey they would if left out packed in the most approved style this being a fact they have no particular occasion for a flight i know that the outdoor men claim that cellar wintered bees do not breed early and are liable to spring dwindle i hardly know what spring dwindling is by good spring management i have never failed to have my hives crowded as soon as there is anything for the bees to do then what is to be gained by having the queen expend her energies in raising vast broods of bees in february and be ready to die when the blossoms come but sometimes failure comes even in the best of cellars but would they have fared any better out of doors nine times in ten the cause can be traced to bees filling their hives from the refuse of cider mills how to keep them from storing such stuff is one of the great problems to be solved it is not to be supposed that any kind of a hole under a house will do to winter bees i have known bees to be packed away among onions cabbage and sauerkraut in the spring they wonder what made their bees die perhaps they were fastened by wire cloth so that the light could be let in and the bees could not get out you know that such must fail is apparent i do not find fault with those who prefer to pack in chaff and winter out of doors i cannot see however that it is the best way it will be the survival of the fittest this winter sure the box hive men and careless beekeepers will go out of the business it is the golden opportunity for the beekeeper of the future soon the fields will be white with the harvest but the laborers will be few the bees will have less competition in the fields and the honey in the market mylan illinois end of section 9 recording by lawrence trask Section 10 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23rd, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23rd, 1881 frank benson in the far east mr jones sends us the annexed extract from a letter of mr benson's and the following appreciative compliment to the b journal for which he will accept our thanks herewith i send you extract from a private letter just received from frank benson dated point de gal ceylon asia january the thirtieth eighteen eighty one the american bee journal has a warm corner in my heart right glad am i that you have taken time by the forelock and issued a weekly i would not have you go back to a monthly for twenty five dollars a year and you deserve the congratulations of every beekeeper that prosperity may crown your efforts is my wish d a jones friend jones i shall start back with nothing but full colonies i have seen two native races of bees here and the comb of a third one race is stingless but worthless the tiniest little fellows three sixteenths of an inch long another race is apis indica the third race i do not believe is valuable since it is a very small bee smaller than apis indica apis dorsata is a wonderful bee whether it can be domesticated or not it builds in the open air on branches often making combs six feet long and i have a good authority for saying that thirty natives have each taken a load of honey from one tree it was not until i reached colombo that i could find out anything about apis dorsata i call it apis dorsata but do not know positively as that is its name 
for no one can tell here, and I have not yet seen the bee, as it was too late when I learned where to find it, to go to that part of the island and reach this French steamer. Everybody says, though, a large bee, from which large quantities of honey are obtained, exists in the interior of the island. The natives all know it by the name Bombera. I start for Singapore by the French steamer Yangtze on January the 31st. Frank Benton End of section 10「Section 11 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Section 11. An Excellent Suggestion. Professor Cook has forwarded us for publication the annexed open letter addressed to Dr. N. P. Allen, President of the North American Beekeepers Society. The reasons adduced in support of the suggestion are well-founded and must strike all minds favorably. September and October are usually among the busiest months of the year to beekeepers and farmers who have their later crops to garner, their honey to take off and prepare for market, their fruit to gather and assort, and their livestock to be made comfortable for winter, while the date proposed by the professor occurs just at that period when everybody can spare the time best, when traveling is the most enjoyable, and is quite late enough to enable an approximate estimate of what the harvest will be. It is competent for the executive committee, of which President Allen is chairman, to fix upon such time as will best subserve the interests of the society. We trust they will give the matter an early and careful consideration. Following is the letter. To Dr. N. P. Allen. Dear Sir, As the proposition which I am about to offer is of general interest to the beekeepers of our country, I beg leave to present it through the American Bee Journal. The American Association for the Advancement of Science convenes at Cincinnati, Ohio, on Wednesday, August 17, 1881. This association had, at its last meeting in Boston, August 1880, more than 1,000 members present. Owing to its influence and the large annual attendance, the local committee at the place where the meetings are to be held are able to procure greatly reduced rates on railroads leading to the place. Now, I would suggest that the North American Beekeepers Association, which is to be held so near Cincinnati, convene at Lexington on Wednesday and Thursday, August 24th and 25th. First, this would accommodate such persons as myself, who wish to attend both meetings and could not afford time or means, were they widely separated by time. Second, a committee consisting of yourself, Mr. Multh of Cincinnati, and Mr. William Williamson of Lexington, I would do what I could to aid, could act in conjunction with the local committee of the AAA of S, and I believe could get the commutation railroad rates to extend to the National Beekeepers Association. Third, August is a quiet time for beekeepers, and so far as I can see, nothing would be lost in making the date of our meeting earlier than the usual time. Fourth, the fact of accommodating such as wish to attend both meetings and the reduced railroad rates, could we secure them, would greatly increase the attendance at the Beekeepers Association and would richly compensate for some loss, if such there would be. I only make this suggestion, hoping that you and others interested will give it such consideration as its merits deserve. A. J. Cook, Vice President of the National Association and President of Michigan Association. Note, at the Utica Convention last month, Mr. L. C. Root was appointed a committee to endeavor to have the bill for the prevention of the adulteration of sugar, syrups, and so forth, then before the legislature of New York, so amended as to include honey. We learn with much pleasure that Mr. Root has succeeded in having it include honey, and Mr. R. is quite sanguine that the bill so amended will become a law of the Empire State. If passed, we hope that the beekeepers of New York will see to it that it not be allowed to become a dead letter in the statute books of that state. End of section 11. Recording by Olivia.
Section 12 of the American Bee Journal. Volume 17, Number 12. March 23rd, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The American Bee Journal. Volume 17. Number 12. March 23rd, 1881. Section 12. Among Our Exchanges. Gleanings. Bees and Grapes. The Classen and Crock difficulty about the bees of the former committing depredations on the grapes of the latter is to be submitted to arbitration. It seems that the real trouble was a personal feud that does not concern beekeepers at all. The grape matter was an outgrowth. This matter was referred to in Professor Cook's article on page 74 of the Bee Journal and should now be entirely divorced from the bee and grape controversy. Bees Dead in Box Hives Mr. G. Castello, Saginaw, Michigan says that on February 22nd he went to a neighbor's five miles distant who had a beehive apiary consisting of 103 colonies of bees. After looking them over, they found only 10 colonies alive. All the rest had died of dysentery. Honey for Sore Eyes Mr. S. C. Perry, Portland, Michigan, says, A neighbor of mine had inflammation in his eyes. He tried many things of many physicians, was nothing better, but rather grew worse, until he was almost entirely blind. His family was sick, and I presented him with a pail of honey. What they did not eat, he put in his eyes, a drop or two in each eye, two or three times a day. In three months' time he was able to read coarse print, and now, after four months' use, his eyes are almost as good as ever. I have also found honey good for common cold sore eyes. Miscellaneous Feeding in Winter Mr. A. B. Weed, in The Michigan Farmer, says, Many colonies were put up for winter with but a small amount of provision, have consumed what was given them, and starved for want of more. Others have but a small amount of stores left, and must be fed soon if they are to be saved. The best way to feed such is to give them frames of well-ripened honey, but this the weather will not always permit. The next best thing for them is candy. This can be given at any time, and can be laid on top of the frames. If the cluster is low down in the hive, it should be put down into it, where it can be reached. Bees and Grapes Mr. W. H. Stout, in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania Farmer, gives the following as his experience. By close investigation, I have satisfied myself that bees do not destroy sound grapes. I had during the past season twenty-two colonies of Italian and common black bees. All the hives were in close proximity to the grapes, while a number had the vines trained over them for shade during the heat of summer. The grapes are of the Concord variety, of which I had an abundance of fine fruit some clusters of which grew within eighteen inches of the entrance to the hives. Bunches of the grapes remained on the vines until the frost had killed the foliage, which fell off and left the grapes exposed, affording every temptation to the bees, and this too through a season when the honey yield from natural sources was so small that the bees consumed stores they had gathered earlier in the season. But the bees do work on grapes, and also on other fruits under certain conditions. If the skin of grapes, peaches, pears, etc., is ruptured from any cause, the bees, wasps, ants, etc., are very quick in discovering it, 
and soon leave only the dried shells during the hot weather of august especially when there are frequent showers the skin of ripening fruit cracks for reason which i will leave to some philosophical friend to explain my conclusions are not hasty nor were my observations superficial but they were prolonged from the time the first grapes ripened until the close of the season i found some clusters of grapes literally covered with bees scrambling and fighting for the little sweets contained in the cracked grapes which are the only ones on which they work as i found out by driving the bees away and removing from the clusters all the bursted grapes when the bees as soon as they found only sound fruit remained went away and left the grapes uninjured we also laid some bunches of grapes on top of the hives and others close to the entrances also left clusters hanging on the vines close to the hives where they remained uninjured by the bees as long as the fruit was sound i know very well that bees can gnaw through heavy muslin or shave off wood and straw to cover the bees we have quilts made of heavy muslin which they sometimes bite through and we have wood and straw hives on which they have enlarged the entrances but nevertheless i am fully satisfied they do no injury whatever to sound fruit feeding rye meal in the indiana farmer mr f l darty says bees will not raise brood without pollen in some shape we frequently find colonies with but very little and at times none at all in crowding them on a few frames quite frequently those left in the hive contain but little if any so it becomes necessary to furnish it to them until they can gather it from natural sources unbolted rye meal is probably the best substitute although they will use wheat flour corn meal oatmeal or in lieu of any of these will even carry sawdust to get the bees started place a piece of comb on the meal and if the weather be pleasant and no pollen to be had they will soon appropriate it they will leave the meal when natural pollen makes its appearance that excellent monthly published in nyen switzerland by monsieur e bertrand the bulletin d'apiculture pour la suisse gives the weekly bee journal the following kind notice we have received the first two numbers of the american bee journal which has been transferred from a monthly to a weekly by its editor mr t g newman only one apiarian publication is issued every two weeks the beinen zuntung of eichstadt that of mr newman's is therefore the only one in the entire world which is published weekly it is also without doubt the most universal its principal contributors are among the most distinguished beekeepers of america together with scientists entomologists chemists and farmers and the number of those who send it communications can be called legion it is with an understanding of the full extent of the services which it renders through the abundance of the observations and of the information which it brings before its readers that we offer to our colleague and friend our warmest felicitations on the occasion of the new development of his publication this very kind notice is the more valuable as monsieur e bertrand is a man of intelligence and wealth whose sole interest is his love of the pursuit of beekeeping l'apiculture the organ of the central societe di apiculture d'italia also gives the bee journal the following very kind notice in its excellent number for february the bee papers are every day augmenting to suit the increasing need of the readers and the publisher of the american bee journal signor newman who came to europe and to milan last year 
announces that at the beginning of eighteen eighty one his monthly journal will be issued every week in mr a hoke's letter on page seventy seven he stated that the dead bees covered the ground for several yards that was bad enough but our compositor made it a hundred times worse by adding the word hundred the reader will please discount that expression accordingly end of section twelve recording by john brandon section thirteen of the american bee journal volume seventeen number twelve march twenty third eighteen eighty one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Selections from Our Letterbox, Part 1. But Few Bees Lost we have had a pretty hard winter for bees, although I have heard of but few losses in this section. My bees are packed in chaff, and all are alive but two colonies, which were very weak when packed. Success to the Bee Journal, F. W. Burtnett, Maurice, Michigan, March 12, 1881. An Old Queen We have had a couple of warm, bright days at last, and my bees are flying. What of them are alive? Out of 33 colonies, I think I have 10 or 12 alive, some of them pretty strong, others weak. I have three Italian colonies. They seemed strongest. What hives I have looked into, where the bees are dead, appear to have plenty of honey, and the other bees appear to be taking the honey out, and I fear are taking from the weak colonies also. Should I prevent them from appropriating it? I noticed some drones with one of my Italian colonies. What does that mean at this time of year? I have been a short distance south, returning home three weeks ago. There has been great loss of bees in Fayette and Wayne counties, as well as in Wabish. Please answer above questions in the Bee Journal. Joel Brewer, Lincolnville, Indiana, March 10, 1881. Editor's Note. It is not advisable to let bees have access to combs and other hives. If they need honey, put the combs in the hives where wanted and not too many. If the strong are robbing the weaker colonies, exchange stands with them. The presence of drones thus early indicates an old or defective queen. Unless there is a large quantity of sealed worker brood, indicating the queen is perfect, we would supersede her as soon as possible, unless the bees save the trouble. Editor gathering pollen my bees gathered pollen lively today and are strong for this time of year my loss in wintering is four colonies leaving eight to commence the season with nearly all the bees in this county are dead john c gilliland bloomfield indiana march 15 1881 no winter flight yet i am trying to winter 163 colonies in mitchell hives all are boxed and packed in chaff, with two thicknesses of burlaps over the bees. The ends of the hives to the division boards are filled with chaff. Combs contracted to such numbers as bees would cover. They were put into winter quarters, November 13, and I have had no flight yet. I find many colonies affected with dysentery, and twelve are dead. It is snowing today with prospects of another blizzard. I cannot estimate the loss at present, will report at a future time. With many others, I am free to throw in my might of joy for the weekly visitations of the journal. D. Vedetto, Northeast Pennsylvania, March 15, 1881. Bees confined four and a half months. This has been the severest winter that I can remember. My 27 colonies of bees have not had a flight since November 1. They are in a cellar, one of my neighbors had over 50 colonies, but there are only five left. He tried to winter out of doors, but has put what he had left in a cider mill. Another had over 20 colonies, wintered out of doors, and lost all. I have but little hopes of having over six or eight colonies. There is but little hopes 
of having whether the bees can have a flight for two weeks yet. We are in a snow blockade yet. We have had but one mail in over two weeks. I like the weekly better each number. It brings us nearer together and we can sympathize with our beekeeping friends. Let us hope for the best. There are better times coming. Success to the weekly. E. Bump, Waterloo, Wisconsin, March 14, 1881. Closed out by fire. I had the misfortune to be closed out of the bee business by fire on the night of March 4, losing all of my 36 colonies of Italians, one of which contained an imported queen. They were all in the cellar. I also lost all the implements necessary to carry on the business, my house and contents. This was closing out rather unexpectedly, but I hope not to remain out very long. William H. Travis, Brandon, Michigan, March 10, 1881. Bees in Good Condition Though there is a great loss of bees hereabouts, mine are yet in good condition, and I hope they will come out right in the spring. The Weekly Bee Journal I value more and more all the time. Thomas Lashbrook, Waverly, Iowa, March 11, 1881. Sweet Clover must the sweet clover be sowed over again, or does it sow itself? Please answer in the weekly bee journal, which I could not do without. It is the best bee paper that is published. Louis Siegman, Newstead, Ontario, March 11, 1881. Editor's Note A good stand of sweet clover will sow itself, as there are generally some seeds that do not catch the soil the first season, but germinate the second. It is more satisfactory, however, to plant the second season about half the complement put in the first, after which it will bloom annually and sow itself. Editor. End of section 13. Recording by Paul Harvey. Section 14 of the American Bee Journal. Volume 17. Number 12. March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Selections from our Letterbox, Part 2. Had a flight in January. In the winter of 1879, I put 30 colonies into my cellar, but it was so warm that they were uneasy, and I put them back on the summer stands. I lost 10 colonies. I now have 20 colonies, facing the south, sheltered by a board fence on the north, and covered with about 18 inches of straw. About 10 days ago, they had a nice flight, and I covered them up again. I think of building a house for them facing the south, and boarding up the other three sides. I will then cover the hives with about two feet of straw, which I can remove on a bright day and give them a flight. I intend to leave the straw on them until warm weather, and thus aid them to keep warm for brood rearing, etc. I wish the Bee Journal success. T. Rice, Lenox, Illinois, February 4, 1881. Nearly all dead. Bees are nearly all dead in this region. I had 33 colonies last fall and now have but 10. A neighbor had 40 and now has none. Another had 44 and now has 2. Another had 75 and three weeks ago they were reduced to 20. Several have lost all but one or two and some have lost all. William S. Buchanan, Hartford, Indiana, March 14, 1881. Bacara Clover Please answer the following questions in the journal. 1. When is the best time to sow Bacara clover? 2. Should it be sown alone or with a grain crop or with other kinds of clover? 3. Should it be cut for hay, pastured, or kept for bees only? 4. Which is the best kind of hive for comb honey? A one-story with racks to hold sections or a two-story? with section boxes put in cases in the upper story. John H. Hurd, Flesherton, Ontario. Editor's Note 1. Early in spring, 
is as good a time as any for planting Baccara, Meliot, or Sweet Clover. We fail to discover any difference in them. 2. For bees alone, sow it alone. 3. If desired for cattle or sheep, sow it with Timothy, letting them graze it, as it blooms but little the first season. Afterward, keep them off. 4. One story with rack is more easily manipulated. Editor. An Enthusiast. My apiary is located on a hillside sloping to the west, and hives fronting south. The Macoupin Creek is one half mile south of it, and several sloughs within a mile, with plenty of soft and hard maple, willows, and cottonwood. I packed rags around and on top of my thirteen hives on their summer stands on the 25th of October. The bees were in good condition. Only one colony gave any surplus. From that I took 40 pounds and left them 35. I examined my bees every week and clean out the dead ones. They had a good flight on the 13th of December and again on February 22nd, when every colony had brood in all stages, and number two was crowded full of young bees and had a queen cell just ready to put the egg in, which I took off. February 26th was a warm day, and number two sent out a swarm. It was queenless, however, so I sprinkled them with peppermint water and united them with number 12, which was weak. I do not keep bees for profit in dollars and cents, but for pleasure, as I do love them. I am a merchant and own 275 acres of land, but being an invalid, look to my bees for recreation. In a radius of four miles from my apiary, on November 1st, there were 13 bee owners, with a total of 73 colonies. On the first instance, there were 19 colonies left, and they were in bad condition. I am the only one taking the bee journal here. Success to it. R. M. Osborne, Kane, Illinois, March 4, 1881. Bees All Dead. I now send you my report for the winter of 1880-81, which will long be remembered by the beekeepers in this locality. I commenced the winter with nine colonies of bees, all carefully packed in chaff on the summer stands with plenty of nice sealed honey. They had packed on the 13th day of last November, and from that until the present time, 121 days, there has not been a single day that the bees could safely fly, and the consequence is my bees are all dead, from the effects of their long confinement. They left plenty of honey, but the combs are badly soiled. I am not discouraged, however, and shall try again. A gentleman living not far from here had only eight colonies left out of 39 two weeks ago. And when spring condescends to smile on us again, we think it will not need a returning board to count the bees in this county. I am well pleased with the new weekly. It is always a welcome visitor. J. R. Kilburn, Fisher Station, Michigan, March 14, 1881. Bees Robbing here in Texas, we have had a severe winter, but not much snow. The thermometer went down to 20 degrees above zero. Last season was a poor one for honey. We had a cold spell in November. Then had warm weather for two weeks, and my hybrid bees began to rob. The pure Italians behaved well, neither robbed nor let the others rob them. I used water and kerosene oil, but it was of no use. At last, I hit upon a remedy. My hives had the bottom boards projecting in front. I ripped out one-inch square pieces, five inches long, cut coarse wire cloth, two by six, bent it lengthwise in the middle, tacked on two sides of each block, leaving wire about five inches to give them air. I drove a nail through each end and nailed it in front of each hive. Every ten or fifteen days, when the weather was fine, an hour before night I let them out to have a fly. We have had fine weather for the last two weeks. I let the bees out on January 30th. They have been busy carrying in pollen from elm since January 31st and have forgotten their stealing propensities. I opened some hives this evening and found plenty of sealed brood and will have drones flying by February 24. J. W. Ekman, Richmond, Texas, February 10, 1881.
Chloroform. About 10 years ago, I used chloroform in handling bees after the following plan. I provided myself with a tin slide about 5 inches long and 2 wide, punched a few holes in it, and stitched on one side of it a pad of 3 or 4 thicknesses of cotton cloth. Then after closing all ventilators and entrances except the lower one, I turned about 1 teaspoonful of chloroform on the pad and slipped it through the entrance and immediately closed the hive with a wad of cloth. I then listened carefully until the bees had nearly ceased humming, or about one or two minutes, and then opened the hive and withdrew the slide. They were cross-hybrid Italians. P. F. Whitcomb, Lancaster, Wisconsin, March 5, 1881. Test for Honey Beekeepers need a good honey test to expose the rag syrup an admixture of honey and glucose, with which the New York market is flooded. In every grocery, meat market, and drug store there can be found cans of Walker's Best Honey labeled Greenpoint, New York. But there is not much honey in it. Last fall, I went into a drug store there with four samples of my best honey. They tested it, and what they used turned it perfectly black. I saw one of Walker's cans of honey there, and asked them to test that. They did so. But the same drugs had no effect whatever on that. They would not tell me what they used to test it, but I would like to have a good and simple test given in the Bee Journal. H. Ritchie. Editor's Note. Pure green tea, well steeped, is used by many to detect the presence of glucose in honey. If the honey dissolves without changing the color of the tea, it is supposed to be pure. But in these days of enterprise, it is frequently a matter of doubt whether the tea is pure, again if, as is claimed, glucose is sometimes manufactured without leaving sulfuric acid or other deleterious substances in it, then the tea would hardly expose it when mixed with honey. Alcohol is also used to detect the presence of glucose, but besides being frequently inconvenient to obtain, it requires considerable skill in its use. Thousands of beekeepers will unite with us in thanking Professor Kedzie of the Michigan Agricultural College for a simple test to detect adulterations in honey and syrups and instructions for its application. Editor. End of section 14. Recording by Paul Harvey. Section 15 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Selections from Our Letter Box, Part 3. Three-fourths of the bees dead. The present severe winter has killed three-quarters of the bees in this section. Bees have not had a thorough cleansing flight since November 8. One apiary of 61 colonies, well packed in chaff and plenty of good stores, will not go through with over 50%. Mine have been confined in the cellar, for 118 days, have wintered well so far, but are becoming uneasy. M. A. Gill, Viola, Wisconsin, March 13, 1881. Mortality of Bees in House and Cellar I put 60 colonies of bees in a house and cellar last November. Twelve of them are dead, and I have taken out one and a half bushels of dead bees. Nearly all have the dysentery. I cannot do without the weekly I wish it much success. Milo Munger, Harvard, Illinois, March 14, 1881. Bees doing well. My bees had a nice flight on the 9th, 10th, and 11th of this month and are now doing well. It is cold again today. J. R. Wagoner, Grantville, Kansas, March 12, 1881. Dwindling in the Cellar. I put 53 colonies in the cellar, in good condition, which are all alive but one. 
but there are a great many dead bees on the bottom of the cellar, more than I ever knew before. I gather them up and carry them away occasionally to prevent their tainting the air. Will the loss of so many weaken the colonies, and what is the cause of it? My bees have not seen the light this winter, yet they seem all right excepting the loss of so many on the cellar bottom. William F. Standish, Evansville, Wisconsin, March 9, 1881. Editor's Note If the colonies were very strong, the loss may not be appreciable. The cause may be attributed to age of the bees when put away and subsequent long confinement, or the cellar may have been too warm at times and the bees become uneasy. Editor Contradictory Experience The poor bees have suffered dreadfully in this locality, and the circumstances and conditions under which some have perished and others survived the past trying season are so varied that I am quite at a loss what to think about bee preservation during the winter season. I had twelve colonies last fall. I packed six with chaff six inches thick around them, and have one colony left of the lot. There is honey in the combs, but the bees are all dead. I put three colonies in the cellar. Two of them are alive, but in a bad condition, the combs being dirty and moldy. I left three on the summer stands, and one is yet alive. None died for want of honey. There was plenty of food for them in the hives. The six were put into the chaff in the latter part of November and taken out on the 8th of March. The combs look clean and free from mold. About a week before I took them out of the chaff, I had taken off the front boards, and finding the bees alive, shut them up again. Upon taking them out, this was the only colony that was alive. When I took the chaff off, the bees were crowded around the entrance, ready to fly, which they did at once, and had a lively time until they were driven inside by the approach of night. Do you think the other five colonies were dead the first time I looked at them? They had a passage through the chaff, one inch high by four wide. A friend of mine here had four colonies wintered outside, with an old piece of sailcloth over them, and only lost one while old beekeepers with between 50 and 100 colonies have lost one half and others have lost all. F. A. Hutt, South Bend, Ontario, March 11, 1881. Editor's Note Your question is a stunner. We have no data on which to base an intelligent opinion. Editor Wintered Without Loss My 27 colonies came through the winter without the loss of a single one, for which I can thank four or five colonies of Italians, for without them I should not have had honey enough to have kept them through, even a moderate winter, to say nothing of such a stringer as we have had. I have withheld my opinion in regard to the change in the journal from a monthly to a weekly, till I had tried it a couple of months, and will now say that it would be a great disappointment if you were to go back to a monthly. I am glad that you have so often devoted your first page in each number to the subject of bee pasturage, for that is, or should be, our leading study now, till we are on surer ground. The best way to make beekeeping popular is to make it pay, and it will pay if we can get the pasturage every year. I would rather have a tip-top honey plant than an apis dorsata, if it had a tongue long enough to lick the molasses out of the bottom of a five-gallon keg. We shall have plenty of white clover this year. William Cam, Murrayville, Illinois, March 12, 1881. Bees Uneasy in the Cellar This has been a very hard winter for bees in this section of the country. Nearly all the bees are dead that were left on the summer stands. I have 40 colonies in the cellar, all alive but restless. They need a cleansing flight very much. The weekly bee journal pleases me very much. Charles H. Dow, Freedom, New York, March 12, 1881. Bees Much Better Than Expected My bees are much better than I had any reason to expect. I left them on their summer stands and did not even take the tops off, but I have them all off now. I had about 80 and now have 70 colonies in good shape. 
I find I must either attend to my bees or quit the business, and have made arrangements with a friend who has about the same quantity who will take charge. We shall call it the gypsy apiary, and our motto will be, if the honey will not come to us, we will go to the honey. Mr. Hedden thinks it won't pay to move for honey, and he is pretty good authority, but we will try. Keep us posted through the journal where is the best place to sell honey. Keep the ball rolling in the suppression of adulterated honey as well as other adulterations. I. H. Shimmer, Hillsboro, Illinois, March 14, 1881. Have young bees and brood. I put 15 colonies of bees into winter quarters and now have 13 in fair condition. Some had young bees two weeks ago, and all of them have brood. The last two years have been very poor for bees, the last the worst, being followed by such a cold and long winter. About one half of the bees in this locality are dead. G. M. Given, Moores Hill, Indiana, March 14, 1881. Bees in the cellar, 135 days. I carried 22 colonies of bees out for a flight on March 8th. This is the first suitable day for bees to fly there has been since they were put in the cellar on the last of October. They came through the four and a half months confinement very well, except two or three third-rate colonies that had more hive room than they could well keep warm through this cold winter, and now they seem to be somewhat reduced in numbers. The day was rather cold, snow did not soften in the shade, but the sun shone brightly. The winds were asleep, and the bees seemed to enjoy the fray, but left a good number of the slain on untrodden snow. They were returned to the cellar at night and will be supplied with water in their hives, hoping to secure the starting of a good cluster of brood before they are placed on their summer stands, about the 1st of May. I usually keep them in confinement without a flight for five or six months with good results, but in 1879 brood rearing ceased about the 1st of September. The hives were destitute to brood when carried out, April 18th, and although the hives filled rapidly with brood before it began to hatch, nearly all the old bees were dead, giving me the most disastrous case of spring dwindling that I have known in an experience of 25 years. I hope to avoid such losses in the future. A. Webster, East Roxbury, Vermont, March 10, 1881. End of section 15. Recording by Paul Harvey. Section 16 of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. The American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881. Selections from our Letterbox, Part 4. The Best Honey for Winter. By this time, I presume all the readers of the Bee Journal know that the winter has been quite severe, about as destructive to the older people as to bees. Bella Lincoln, the oldest beekeeper in this section of the country, died this winter, and since then nearly all of his 100 colonies of bees have also died. My sixty colonies are in the cellar with chaff over the frames. Some are dead. And the entrances to others are soiled, indicating dysentery. Several which had sealed honey stored in the summer are all right. Some worked on a cider mill. But if they have good sealed honey, I do not think it makes so much difference about the kind of winter. I like the weekly bee journal because it enthuses me every time I read it. In any kind of business, one needs some enthusiasm at least once a week. C. F. Smith, Jr., Vandalia, Michigan, March 12, 1881. Carrying in Pollen My five colonies of bees wintered well on summer stands in double-walled 
Langstroth hives. They are carrying in dark pollen today. I think they get it from the maple. H. H. Littell, Louisville, Kentucky, March 5, 1881. Chaff packing of bees triumphant. The winter has been a severe one everywhere. Since the 1st of November until the first days of this month, my bees had not had a flight. I live in a very high altitude, about the highest good land in the state. The winter begins early and lasts long. We have an abundance of snow now, and it is blustering wildly today. I despaired of seeing my bees come out alive. They were covered solidly with snow for three months, only the tops of the hives being visible. At last the weather softened, and I dug away the snow. The next day or two the sun came out warmly, and my bees began to fly. And greatly to my happy disappointment they are all alive, all that I had out on the summer stands. One only was dull, which I examined and found enfeebled with dysentery, arising from the feed I gave them in the fall. All others were strong. Just 122 days had intervened between the flights. The sick colony has since died, but the others are in the best condition. This success is a tribute to the chaff-packing hive. Is there another record of 122 days confinement and yet come out strong? W.S. Blaisdell, Randolph, Vermont, March 11, 1881. Look out for the robbers. We have had a very hard winter on bees in this section of the country. Bees that were not properly packed for winter are nearly all dead, while those that were properly packed are nearly all in good condition. We are having good weather now, and the bees are flying nicely. Those having weak colonies and hives of combs without bees will have to look out for robbers and keep their small colonies crowded upon as few combs as they can, keeping the entrance contracted so that only one or two bees can enter at one time. Hives in which the bees have died should be closed tightly. The weekly bee journal is a welcome visitor. I could not think of doing without it. J. A. Osborne, Rantoul, Illinois, March 17, 1881. Two-thirds of the bees have died. Over two-thirds of all the bees in this part of the state are now dead. I have met with a heavy loss on account of a cider mill that was within 80 rods of my apiary last fall. Hiram Roop, Carson City, Michigan, March 12, 1881. Bees in Good Condition We put out on the summer stands on the 9th and 10th of March 150 of our 200 colonies that we had in the cellars in good condition. These were the first days the bees could fly with safety since the 1st of November. We have 50 colonies more in one cellar, but as they seem to be doing well, we shall leave them in until it becomes settled weather. We left nine colonies on their summer stands, but the winter was so long and severe that we could not feed them, and three of them starved. Now we are busy transferring, that is shaking the bees off the combs, cleaning them off, and putting them into clean hives. If we find any not strong enough, we double them up. We consider ourselves nearly masters of the winter in question, as our real losses for the last ten years, we think, would not exceed six percent. In fact, we did not lose a colony in winter or spring until the number had reached about one hundred. The Bee Journal is a welcome weekly visitor. T.S. Bull and Son, Valparaiso, Indiana, March 15, 1881. Death reigns among the bees. Having made some inquiry concerning the bees within a radius of about two miles, I find some beekeepers, some who keep bees, and those that let the bees keep themselves. Mr. H. had three colonies, all are dead. Mr. L. had seven, one left. Mr. D. left his eleven colonies without protection and now has eleven empty hives for sale. Mr. B. let the winter's blast try his twenty colonies and now has twelve empty hives. Mr. F. packed thirty-seven in chaff and has eleven left. Mr. A. put up fifty-seven in complete order, but with all his precaution all are dead. Mr. B. put into winter quarters, 
73 colonies of fine Italians, 58 of them are dead. I packed in clover chaff 101 colonies, and 23 have gone the way of all the earth. My bees were confined in their hives from October 20th until March 6th. I packed 24 in Langstroth hives, with space the whole width of hive left open to give plenty of fresh air, yet at the same time warm, with a due amount of packing, and in this lot have not lost one colony, and very few bees. But the end is not yet. Today I found young bees with brood in all stages. G. W. Naftsker, South Haven, Michigan, March 17, 1881. No loss in wintering. Nearly all the bees in this vicinity that were left to care for themselves are extinct. I had 14 colonies packed comfortably in chaff before the cold weather commenced and have not lost any yet. I am highly pleased with the weekly bee journal and wish it great success. J.P. Moore, Morgan, Kentucky, March 14, 1881. Poor season, but fair profit. After selling my surplus colonies, I commenced the season of 1880 with 37 colonies in fair condition, increased by division and natural swarming to 63 and 12 nuclei. I reared 30 Cyprian and Italian queens, had 100 gallop frames of foundation drawn out, and extracted 400 pounds of honey. Estimating the increase at $6 per colony, and deducting the expenses, my income for care and labor is $250, or about $6.50 for each colony in the spring. I put 75 colonies in fair condition, including the 12 nuclei, into winter quarters December 8th. Some were short of stores, and all had poor honey. On March 1st, I found 8 colonies and 4 nuclei dead. 4 starved and 8 died from the effect of poor honey and long confinement. More of them are diseased and must have a flight soon or die. With the loss of stock already mentioned and allowing for more to follow, the credit will be cut down to $3.50 per colony. The season has been the poorest I ever knew, but even $3.50 is a fair profit on the investment. White clover gave no honey, basswood lasted only 10 days, but yielded well. Had it lasted two weeks longer, I should have had an average yield of honey for the season. Without this flow of basswood honey, the bees must have been fed, but now they have enough stores to carry them through till spring. As the heavy snows have no doubt preserved the clover, the outlook for honey this summer is good, I hardly need say that I am pleased with the weekly bee journal. T. E. Turner, Sussex, Wisconsin, March 1, 1881. Planting Buckwheat for a Honey Yield In answer to Mr. A. Hodges on page 78, I will say that buckwheat is a peculiar plant about yielding honey. I have never known it to fail here in yielding enough honey for the bees' winter stores, and usually very much more. In other localities, in the same latitude, it cannot be relied on at all for a honey crop. It seems, however, that it never yields through the entire season in which it can be made to bloom. Quite a large amount of it is cultivated every season in my vicinity, much of it generally coming into full bloom as early as the middle of July, yet I have never known it to yield any honey earlier than the 1st of August, and very rarely before the 10th. But when it commences to yield honey, it does so profusely until the plant itself is ripe or killed by frost. I would say to Mr. Hodges, or anyone else intending the sowing of successive crops of buckwheat, that it is useless to sow any early in the season, to blossom before the 1st of August. I am intending to sow about 20 acres of it this season for my bees. I shall put the first crop of it in the ground about June 25th, the rest about July 10th. That from the last sowing will remain in bloom until frost comes, even if that is delayed later than ordinary. O. O. Poppleton, Williamstown, Iowa, March 9, 1881. End of section 16. 
Recording by Paul Harvey. End of the American Bee Journal, Volume 17, Number 12, March 23, 1881.